Welcome to Whips in the Dungeon 101.8, Snake Whips. We have quite a lot to cover today uh, because there are different types of snake whips, so let's start with those different types. The focus of Whips in the Dungeon is dungeon whips, uh, but let's start with snake whips in general. I've got three snake whips laid out on the floor here. The longest one is called a black snake because it has a heavier shot load, very heavy shot load. This is an eight foot snake, which total length is about 10 and a half feet. So black snake. The next snake, the snake in the middle, I'm just gonna call a snake whip. It's a six foot long snake with a, four, with a, a two or three foot fall. Our total length on that whip is 10 inches. Then I have a, a three foot snake, which with its fall puts it about six foot total length. The black snake has an extremely heavy shot load. You can tell by the diameter of the bore on this thong. The reason it's called a black snake is you could actually use that in self-defense like a blackjack. It's a great whip for throwing wraps. Uh, you almost have to be outdoors to throw it. I've been in a couple of dungeons large enough that I could throw wraps with that black snake. The regular snake that's six foot long, about eight and a half feet total length, uh, again, is a great whip to throw wraps with. It's very difficult to be accurate enough to throw directly on the back with a snake whip that's that long. People that'll tell, or that tell you that a short snake isn't accurate enough to throw in dungeon play uh, just haven't had enough time working with a, a whip like that. So we're going to go real quickly and talk a little bit about construction and the differences between a dog signal and a snake whip. The dog signal we introduced yesterday, its characteristic starts with a heel knot, can also be called a pommel. The type of knot that it is is a Turk set. That's common between dog signal whips, snake whips, and bull whips. Uh, most dog signals and snake whips will have a wrist loop or a hanging loop. You can put your wrist through it or you can just use it to hang the whip up. I actually pr prefer a whip that has a clean pommel and no wrist loop. But usually when you order a whip, you have to specify that. So the dog signal has a heel knot, the thong of the whip, and the specific characteristic of the cracker being platted into the end of the thong. All whips will have a belly and a spine. So when we move to a snake whip, the difference is you have heel knot or pommel, thong. The thong ends with what's called a fall hitch. Sometimes you'll hear it called a keeper. Keeper, fall hitch. Fall hitch is the type of knot. Keeper is kind of the function that it serves because it keeps the fall in place. The fall is a piece of latigo, or in this instance, red hide. And then the crackers tied on to the fall. Okay. Uh, all snake whips, uh, as well as dog signals, have a shot load. Uh, they'll have a heavier or lighter shot load. Uh, depending on the preference of the thrower and what's specified. Uh, we have a divergence here, and the divergence when we move from signal whips to snake whips is we're going to throw our bow and arrow. You can hold it at the end of the fall and throw it thus, or you can actually hold it at the keeper and throw it thus. Over the shoulder remains pretty much the same. And the forward figure eight, today I'm gonna to talk about this a little bit. I want you to pretend you're standing in between railroad tracks and the railroad tracks run down either side of you. And when you throw your figure eight, recover the whip outside the railroad tracks and throw it out, uh, recover on both sides, 
outside of the railroad tracks and we're not talking about cracking this figure eight our practice so far has been to keep a nice even arc nice even arc we'll get to cracking later on when we get to cracking I want to make sure the first time you try to crack your whip that you wear safety glasses or some sort of eye protection and a nice stiff brim hat will also help protect your head and face. Very important when you start to crack your whip. Now I'm going to go back to the bow and arrow because there's a technique I talked about in the beginning, but I don't want you to, uh, to, to forget it. The bow and arrow, you leave the whip out. See how I leave my hand out? You throw it and leave it out. Did everyone hear that little puff? That's a light crack. And that light crack was done just with a thumb push, okay? I told you not to do a towel crack. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate a towel crack and you'll see why you don't wanna do a towel crack. Because that whip's gonna come back and hit you. It'll come back faster than it went out and you could hit yourself in the face. Very important, we'll leave it out, okay? Uh, the other divergence is when we move to uh, snake whips, because the fall is flexible, you're gonna have a problem when you start throwing horizontal. Now this is a two foot snake with the fall, it's, it's about four foot total length. And you can see when I do horizontal, I can keep a nice even horizontal movement. There's a little bit of flutter, okay? But as that snake whip gets longer and the fall gets longer, gravity's going to cause the fall to fall. And when the fall falls doing horizontal, I lose my accuracy. So when we move from dog signal whips, which could be thrown horizontally or overhand, when we move to snake whips, snake whips are gonna be very difficult to throw horizontally, and you're gonna see that divergent fork in the road where your snake whip is gonna respond much better coming overhand with a forward figure eight. So from, from now on, we're gonna be leaning more toward using a forward figure eight and moving away from using a dog signal whip. Um, I'm going to introduce also a new material, uh, paracord, inexpensive paracord whips uh, are, are a nice way to start if your budget can't afford a kangaroo whip. We have much more to talk about with snake whips and bull whips. Tomorrow is bull whips. Your keyword today is leather.